Hello again, Biology 300 students. Mr. Parker here, and in today's screencast session number five, we're going to look at population ecology. And you can see the two diagrams that are on the uh, screen here. You can see there's looking at the population growth over time. Uh, we have two different curves looking at logistics growth versus exponential growth. Uh, logistics is also referred to as the S shape, and exponential growth is also referred to as the J shape. And we'll go and take a cl closer look at this uh, here in a few minutes. Um, you should have your notebook paper out, taking some notes down. Uh, we'll take our screencast quiz um, when you come back into class. Uh, so we're looking at first the idea of population growth. Okay, And this population growth is limited um, by the carrying capacity of the particular environment. And you can see here on the right-hand side that that carrying capacity is defined as, um, and what it's determined by, is these limiting factors. Um, basically, carrying capacity is how many organisms that um, this particular ecosystem or community can hold and withstand where there's a um, really there's no positive growth or negative growth it's kind of equal out and um, it has enough resources as in food shelter to carry on um, the different uh, species populations and communities okay so um, moving forward from here you take a look at the two different uh, types of growth curves um, Notice here that we have time on the, the x-axis and we have y, uh, population on the y-axis. Uh, we have our J-shaped curve, which is also referred to as the exponential growth curve. Okay, And then we have our S-shaped curve that you can see there, and um, that's our logistic growth. Um, the J-shaped curve, is there's basically no lim limiting factor to it. Um, it's going to grow exponentially, whereas when we look at our S-shaped curve here, you can see eventually it will have this exponential growth, but then eventually it levels off, and that's due to the carrying capacity within that ecosystem. Um, it's going to eventually the growth is going to level off, whereas um, exponential growth will continue to grow um, until some some type of dramatic change occurs um, within the environment that will cause the growth to slow down or actually stop eventually. Okay, so uh, I had mentioned the idea of limiting factors. Okay, and basically how you define what a limiting factor is is factors that control the population growth. Okay, um, basically this helps maintain the level between extinction and overpopulation, so it meets that happy medium. So um, it could be look, you could be looking at the human population or any other type of population. There's always limiting factors. Uh, there's two different types of limiting factors. You have your density dependent, and you have your density independent. So if you look at just the terms here, that's density dependent. That's dependent upon the size of the population. And your density independent um, has the, the size of the population doesn't play a role in it. Okay, we'll take a look at each one of these a little bit closer on the next couple slides. Okay, so first one that we're going to look at is the idea of density dependent limiting factor. Okay, and this operates under the idea of a very large population. Okay, so the population size does matter in this. And that's why we refer to it as dependent on the density. Um, and some examples that you can see here is competition, predation, parasitism, overcrowding, and stress. So when you think about a large population, these organisms have to compete for food. They have to compete for uh, shelter and other resources. Uh, predation, parasitism, overcrowding, and stress will kind of go through each one of these um, individually. Um, but there is going to be this competition. And again, it kind of goes back to the idea of um, natural selection. That the fittest and strongest are going to survive, and the weaker ones are going to die off eventually. And that nature is going to limit these upon what the resources are available for those particular species. Okay, so that's density dependent. And uh, kind of going through the idea of competition, um, this occurs when two or more species rely on similar limiting resources. Resources, so you can be talking about, again, the space as in shelter for security, or you, know, you could be talking about food. So you just have to have two organisms that are competing for whatever the resource is. And in this particular diagram, you can uh, see these two marine lives that are looking to uh, compete for this face of the rock here along the coast, the coast um, along the ocean there. And what you will notice eventually, we have this whole entire niche from the high tide to low tide. Niche is the area that these organisms will inhabit. And what you will notice here is that the blue marine life here will outcompete the um, brown marine life. So what has to happen, the um, upper marine life has to figure out to a way to adapt to living um, only in the areas of the high tide and having less resources 
um, otherwise they will die off. So the blue organisms have um, outcompeted them for this area, the, um, the cliff, to make them better suited for their particular environment. Okay, so there's an idea of what we call the competitive exclusion principle. And what this states here is when two species are competing for the same resources, and they need to do three things, or one of three things, in order to do um, to be successful um, when there's competition. Okay, um, so you have two. So what we do is we have two organisms that are competing for the same resource. One's going to have to either migrate to another area, okay, they're going to have to leave this particular environment or habitat and move back somewhere else. Um, they're either going to need to shift its feeding habits or behavior, so maybe they eat at a different time, they find different organisms they need to eat. Um, if they do not do either of these, they're going to suffer a sharp decline in their population, and they could become eventually extinct. So if we look at, uh, for example here, okay, we have an owl and a, uh, an eagle here. Um, these two organisms will compete for the same resources, and they will have to change their eating habits. One of them, uh, the weaker one, will have to change their eating habits, so the eagle here will be able to outcompete the owl, and the owl will have to find a different time to either feed, it will either need to migrate and move to a different area, or that owl, that particular owl in that particular area will become extinct or its numbers will um, decline dramatically. Okay, so that was the competitive exclusion principle. Uh, predation is a pretty common sense type of an idea. It's one species hunts another species. Um, as you can see here, um, we have this particular bobcat hunting the, um, the snow hare. And you can see the hare has had some ad adaptations uh, because of its colorization to fit into its environment. But um, we have the predator, which is the cat, and we have the prey, which is the rabbit. And um, that is going to be one another limiting factor, the density-dependent limiting factor which in, within an environment. Okay, and then what we have is something called the predator-prey relationship. Um, and looking at this graph, and we're talking about the snowshoe hare and the lynx, the cat there, that was on the previous pages, what you should notice here is as the population of the snow hare goes up, the population of the lynx will go up typically you know, the, the year later, which pretty much makes sense when you look at the graph as, as the prey, there's more prey, okay, so the predator, there's more food for predators, so it's able to withstand more uh, the particular cats um, as the population as the time goes. Now, as you increase the amount of predators, the lynx, eventually the population of the rabbits will go down, and then what happens is eventually the population of the lynx will go down. So they basically coincide together. As the snow hare population goes up, the lynx will slowly follow it. And as the um, snow hare population goes down, the lynx will, will follow the um, decline in population of the, um, when the prey declines. Okay? And you can see that as you follow yourself away uh, through the graph, um, every time the um, hare population's up, the predator population goes up. And every time the population, the um, hare's population goes down, so does the lynx population goes down. So that's just a predator-prey relationship, just looking at the graph and seeing the, um, how they coincide together. Okay, so parasitism, okay, so we're talking about parasites, and this is basically a relationship between two different uh, kinds of organisms in which one receives benefits from the other by causing damage to it, okay? So basically what you have is you have this host, in this particular example you have the host is a caterpillar here, and then you have the parasites that are basically leaching off them and taking nutrients from them, and it's, it's harming the host. So a parasite is basically um, extracting nutrients from a particular organism and doing harm to that particular organism. All right, um, so we have the density dependent that was dependent upon the population. We're looking at um, only the large sizes of the uh, population. Now we're looking at density independent limiting factors. And these um, limiting factors do not depend upon the population size. Okay, um, they, what, a couple of examples as you can see here what includes our natural disasters, uh, climate fluctuations. So it basically it doesn't matter, you know, if a tornado is going to hit, it doesn't matter if it's a high population, populated area or if it's a small populated area, the natural disaster is going to hit. Um, you know, if a hurricane hits, it's going to hit, it doesn't matter on what the population is. The change of climate, okay, the population doesn't affect that. Now, when we're looking at the dependent population, uh, limiting factors, you know, the competition, the predation, the parasitism, those all depended upon the size of the population. Um, what we get from a density independent uh, limiting factor 
is we get what we call a boom or bust curve. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, what happens here in this limiting fact, this type of limiting factor, is the organism will eventually have this boom. Okay, and then what happens is this natural disaster will come about, and then there will be this great decline that you see. Okay, so. There's no limiting factor occurring here on this big, huge exponential growth, this J-shape. And then eventually up here, some natural disaster, if it's a hurricane, tornado, it's climate change, whatever it is, then there's this bust in the curve. So the density uh, independent factors will lead to what we call it, referred to as the boomer bust uh, curve. Okay, and another idea that we have talked about before is something called symbiosis. And what um, we call this symbiotic relationships. And basically what it is, these are organisms that are living together. Uh, there's three different types. I've mentioned one of them already is a parasitism, there's mutualism, and commensalism. Okay, so we're going to run through each one of these and give you a better idea what each one um, is all about. All right, so the first one is parasitism. And again, uh, kind of the same definition as we had before. It's a relationship where one species benefits and the other is harmed. So as you can see over here on the right-hand side, I have the first piece, species is a positive, so it's, it's a benefit for them. And then the second species is going to be harmed. Um, and taking a look here, you can see we have the tick, and, and that's you know, a dog tick, basically sucking in the dog, taking the nutrients, the blood and stuff from the particular dog. So it's not going to do, it's going to harm the dog, but it's going to benefit the tick. Okay, so that's an example of parasitism. Uh, mutualism. Okay, in mutualism, it's a mutualistic relationship, so it's going to benefit both organisms. Um, so it's a positive for both species. All right, and looking here at the bee uh, and the flower, okay, this is a, a benefit for, for both because the bee is going to get the nectar that it needs and the flower is able to get the pollination that it needs in order to carry on the species of that particular flower. So they are both benefiting from this particular re relationship. Uh, the third one is commensalism. And this is a relationship where um, one species benefits and the other one's not harmed at all. So it's a positive for one and no effect on the other. And here you can see the cattle eager. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a relationship with the cattle with the bird here. And what the bird is using is able to do is um, basically it eats. Instead of going off and having to go off and hunt and find its own food and seeds and stuff like that, what they do is they actually take um, the seeds and the grains from the droppings of the cattle and they're able to take the resources out of there. So it doesn't benefit the cattle, okay, but it does benefit the egrets because um, it doesn't have to go off and seek its own food, which they're not very good at um, gathering. Um, that's why you see a lot, if you know, ever watch like a National Geographic or something, you see egrets there, um, as in this picture, um, with the cattle. All right. So that is um, a screencast session, session number five on uh, population ecology. We, we went through um, the S-shaped curve, which is your um, looking at the population growth. You look at your J-shaped curve, which is the exponential growth. Your uh, S-shaped your was your uh, logistic growth. And then uh, we talked about some of the different limiting factors, the density dependent, which depend upon the population, density independence, which was uh, which was not dependent upon the population. And uh, then we went through different, three different types of relationships, your mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So again, that was screencast session number five on population ecology.